is our amazing panel of judges. And their role after each of the presentations will be to offer some helpful comments, some suggestions, and whatever else you'd like to offer. And we're going to encourage audience participation, too, to a limited extent, because we're not going to be here all night. So we're going to try to keep things moving along. And uh, so if Jean, let, why don't you introduce yourself? Thank you, Lori. I'm a general partner and founder of a firm called Starvest Partners. We're here in New York City. Uh, I always like to share, not that it should matter, but we're three women general partners and one trophy male. Yes, go for it. And if I don't get a laugh on that, I just keep going. So, so uh, we- it Depends on the number of women in the audience. <laughs> and uh, my total, I'll put in this commercial message, my pro bono work is I am really dedicated, it just happened kind of magically, to uh, women owned and women CEO uh, uh, companies, so I'm um, very involved in Astia, Springboard, Golden Seeds, the Pipeline Fund. I just love to help entrepreneurs uh, stay out of the ditch that I might, might have slid in or I've seen others slide into. I love to do that, I have a passion for that. So if you're a women-owned company, uh, my uh, sidebar is to try to help you get mentored, et cetera. So at Starvest, we are on the pro, I'm here tonight, first of all, I uh, adore Lori, and if she asks me to do something, I'm here uh, and uh, showing up for that because we are selfishly on the prowl for great deals. We are investing out of a 2009 $250 million fund. We are so uh, happy to have that because it's a great time to be investing. And uh, I was in Boston yesterday for a big conference, big uh, in, you know, investor banking conference, and all the Boston VCs said, 60% of our deal flow is in New York. So is that cool or what? And uh, uh, so here we are, and oh, I hate it when those Boston and California VCs come in and dig in our sandbox, and we're not aware. So I'm here because I'm looking for, we're on the prowl for great companies. And so if you want to do business with us, I will unabashedly say that uh, we like the expansion stage, meaning 2 million to 15 million top line, but we like to look early too, because we know the deals are getting done earlier. So we're happy to see an earlier investment in about five buckets. We love everything SaaS and recurring revenue. We were early in ad tech and did uh, uh, ad serving, email campaign software, and iCrossing very early, who learned how to extract millions of dollars from Fortune 500 companies when people were dazed and confused about SEO and SEM. And so uh, that's, that's uh, been great and we're still very close to that company. And uh, we like data as a service, rich data you can monetize. We like e-commerce software. I'm proud to say that we were in Ideally Early, one of those flash sale sites, and two weeks ago they got named number one in the Inc. 500. We were thrilled with that. And then risk and security software. So those kinds of areas are important to us. And I welcome you to send me an email and, and I'll say yes, no, or maybe as quickly as possible. So enough of that. And I would just try and inspire you, I love to share this. In just Q2 alone, over $1.5 billion was invested in 310 first financing deals. And you too can get the wallets out of our pockets if you know how to do it. So. <laughs> <laughs> to you, Peg. It's always tough sitting next to Jeannie because I've done a lot of panels with her and her energy is so big. I'm like, okay. Uh, hi, Peg Jackson. Um, so I was doing venture for the last 15 years around New York and got really excited about all this activity going on in the last couple of years and realized, wow, with all this funding, there's going to be some exits. So last week I joined Gridley & Co., a uh, investment technology bank here in New York. And what's really interesting about Gridley, which I love about it, is they do amazing research around um, digital internet companies. So today we actually launched um, a digital guide to New York, which lists um, all the major private companies in New York by sector, uh, content, you know, marketing, e-commerce, you know, I think it has 10 different categories. Uh, and then for you entrepreneurs out there, it lists all the active VCs in New York from local to actually West Coast firms that are investing here by stage. 
Uh, so we're hoping it really helps the startup community out there in terms of educating people on you know, how to go out and find the money and also for uh, who's your competition. <laughs> so a, a whole range of information. So I'm looking forward to hearing about the presentations today and uh, meeting you all after. Thanks. All right, uh, good evening everybody. I'm Eric Nordlander. I'm uh, part of Google Ventures, uh, part of the Bastion here in New York. Um, Google Ventures is Google's VC arm and we invest about $200 million a year in uh, companies from very early stage to very late. Um, something you might not know about Google Ventures is we're not actually strategic, we're completely financially motivated, separate, separate fund structure, um, so we're a little bit unlike other corporate VCs in that sense. I've been with them for about a year and a half, and prior to that I was held all kinds of different roles at Google, started as a software engineer, and uh, did lots of interesting things in advertising, both AdWords, AdSense, and a whole slew of other things, uh, so I have to be in the web advertising panel. Um, and I spend my days you know, looking at companies uh, and helping, helping our portfolio companies with lots of technical issues and even writing some code. Uh, and once, once upon a time, I was a, a course six student at MIT, so I'll throw that in there. You're <laughs> <laughs> <an> alumni. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you, all of you. And thanks so much for being judges at this event. Uh, all right, so the rules of the road. Each company has exactly six minutes to present. And we have our timekeeper here. Wave hello. <laughs> um, each presenting company, just keep an eye on him. At one minute, he's going to hold up a sign. It says one minute left. So you'll know where you are. And we go like this at six minutes. We're also going to limit our feedback and discussion to six minutes, too, so that we're not here all night. And there's more food outside, so I don't want to keep you from the food. So, so six minutes, six minutes, and it's going to be a nice rolling discussion, and I hope it leaves time for networking. So um, our first presenter, Album Plus. Um, I'm Adam Burke. This is Amir. We're from Album Plus. Uh, we, we snuck our demo up here. It's better than our, our pitch deck. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's, it's real-time photo sharing for events, um, like this one, or say a wedding. Um, so if you download Album Plus, either on the Android or uh, an iPhone, um, the event code is MITIM, or geolocation should work, uh, and pull that up automatically. Um, like I said, it's photo sharing um, for events. Uh, we think that there's no real way, you know, people ask you to sign on for a different account, the, you know, Pic uh, Facebook or... Um, Picasa, Flickr, so, and they end up, you go to a wedding, you go to an event like this, and you take photos, everyone's taking photos, and everyone's putting photos in different places. And at the end of the day, sometimes a host just wants all those photos in one place. So what the problem is, that is so that's the problem, and the solution is we're trying to leverage location. So everyone has a mobile device. Um, if you get, if we think if you capture the photos at the source uh, and don't let them kind of, you know, they can go to Facebook and they can go to Twitter afterwards. But if you get the photos by geolocation um, and having the host sort of say this is this is where we want our photos, um, sort of how Lori's been kind enough to do for us tonight, um, we think there's a much better chance of sort of creating that sticky point in the first place, and then you can use email and the web to add your photos back to that, that gallery. Um, and then, you know, we mentioned weddings and events like this. Uh, we, we charge the host, our business model is charging the host for the gallery, <coughs> customize it. Um, we're trying to get into, after, we're trying to stay focused on weddings, but we see an opportunity with, with stadiums, um, charity events, corporate events, where, where they kind of want to control the gallery and use it for marketing purposes. Um, trying to get through the deck as quick as possible and, and then put the, put the demo back up so it's sort of an interactive pitch. And we, uh, it works with real cameras too. We sort of, we, we jerry-rigged this camera. See if you can get the... Yeah. So uh, our business no. model is really simple. I mean, we just charge per event. Um, very simple, and then we get all the revenue streams from fulfillment. You know, people want to order stuff, uh, photos. You want to do RSVP cards. You want to do uh, the bridal shower, and people are taking photos, and then you send RSVP cards to everyone with those uh, photos. Um, all right, so now we're gonna do a little demo. So. It, 
this is the main screen of the app. So when you're taking photos, I mean, if you guys download Album Plus, it's free on the App Store or go to or find Album Plus on the uh, Android Marketplace. You just take the photos, it, uh, it geolocates you, and all the photos just go straight up. We're also integrated with uh, iFi, so um, you can, uh, iFi is this card that's part of the SD card that goes in. Uh, we attach it to the gallery, and then people can just have cameras uh, take photos, and they all appear live. Um, so instead of having buying a hundred disposable cameras, putting them on all the tables at a wedding, people can actually just get normal cameras or use the normal cameras that everyone's using, put the SD cards in, and then as people take photos, they all appear live. And then at the end, the bride, the groom, whoever the event organizer is can go organize the photos, tag the photos, share the photos. Anyone can view it live anywhere, wherever they are. Um, and that's about it. Anything else? No. Great. Thank you. That was, what's the official time? Uh, 1.42. Left? Good job. Good. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to speed it along. We got a demo. Here. So, Lori, I know you. How controversial do you want us to be? You want us to be <laughs> tough as hell. Go, go for it, Gene. Go for it. Okay. So, <laughs> let me tell you. I love it. I love the app. I think it's clever, great, and all. But you know what you didn't tell me? How are you going to go to market? How are you going to really rise above the clutter? What kind of channel partners can you go to? Because this is powerful. And uh, I'm not crazy. Uh, I'll just load it all in here. I'm not crazy about the business model I heard because I just went to a reunion. I cannot tell you the number. It's so large, it's staggering. But that's what we did. They want us all to send our photos to Shutterfly. I'm very capable, but I struggled to do that. I did it. But wow, how easy this would be for reunions too, which yeah. is a very you know recurring event. But I'm not gonna. Who are you gonna charge in a reunion, right? right. So wouldn't there be a clever micro payment thing? I'd pay something to do that. So, so talk to us about that. We we have an answer for your first question preloaded. So we just took a, a seed seed slash angel investment from a gentleman. Lori helped us put it together, and he's a, a, a has domain experience in the wedding industry. So he just sold a company that specialized in, uh, in, mess in sign in boards. So he's bringing on a ton of, we, we said we'd rather have his connections than his money. So, which is basically what we're ending up getting. But, um, you know, so he, he's coming on board really to bring us t to the wedding. We're trying to stay focused on the wedding market. Uh, he, you know, he's got the contacts with vendors and with brides and bridal shows and he's, his contact list and all that stuff. So that's, that's our focus with weddings right now. How much do you charge, though? We're, we're experimenting with pricing. That's we're okay. Thinking, you know, 19 to $99 for total customization if you want some of these cameras floating around at your wedding. Um, $19. You a white label that's different. And yeah, so we have lots. I mean, pricing is really difficult, especially when you, you know, we're one of the first people to market with this kind of price. All right, so now tell me about go to market and just a quick kind of softball. Have you considered going to like a Shutterfly? That could really use this because that's difficult. We've been talking Amir, to different partners. Amir, to go speak. Yeah. yeah. So we've had we've we've talked to different partners like the Knot, uh, not Shutterfly and stuff because they we're talking to them more on the fulfillment side. Okay. Um, but to for the Knot and what was that? I can't think of the other. <laughs> Building widget as yeah. far as as far as the destination where those pictures end up. Um, we haven't really wedding planners, <laughs> people like that, and we are reaching out to that. Actually, to answer your other question about how to do micropayment, yeah. uh, what we can do is, uh, you want to talk about oh, domain? Yeah, so <laughs> basically, we have a button at the bottom or a button on the app, okay. and what happens is that uh, you use the app, and if you want to keep the photos, if you want to support the <laughs> app, you basically can donate on the app. We don't have it built in yet, but that's our, it's in the pipeline. So you go to a big charity event. And so maybe we do a revenue split with the charity. So uh, you can right there, you take photos during the charity event, and then you wanna donate a little bit of money to the charity, you can donate, and we take a, some kind of cut. How about, it sounds bad with charities. How, so easy to use, I think you, you, you know, 
it's only as good as how many people use it. So how proprietary is it? Because I heard you had a handout, special cameras. I'm assuming people can download it on their iPhone and start taking pictures, right? So so again, if you get people to use it, so I think going to channel partners, like you mentioned, is a creative way. And I've seen a lot of competition in this area, focus on the knot and um, the venue, something about the venue is what struck me. And there's people like Eventbrite or some of these event management groups that mm -hmm. even like Evite, where you can, you know, maybe partner with them to help get distribution to use things at an event and make it more of a enterprise type pricing than a consumer, you know, pay per download app or something. And even, like even the venues themselves, so not even just the, the sites that manage and, and aggregate events, like, you know, having something at the plaza where they have their own sort of, you need the network to be in sync with the cameras, to be in sync with the app. Mm -hmm. So sort of a lot less goes <laughs> wrong when they, when the venue itself gets this network set up not, not to mention the pipeline where we're not pitching yeah. in bride by bride. They have it installed yeah. and Every Monday, basically, we switch the gallery code, and everything works automatically once the once the venue is set up. It's basically hard coding the venue itself. Yeah, because the there's technology. a lot of uh, event management. There's one I know that does like large corporate events, three thousand type people, mm -hmm. where they'll pay money for this right. kind of even yeah. as long as it's very solid and easy for people to access. Even so. uh, CrowdRise. So mm -hmm. they they were doing an event. So someone just a friend happened to be going, you know, trying to stay focused yeah. on weddings. But they had an event at a bowling alley, so. You know, the, the charity sort of wants all those photos, and they also mm -hmm. want to sort of promote right. their charity. So basically, creating something where, say, CrowdRise, once you set up a charity, you know, you get a, a code automatically generated. Obviously, we're happy to do that, and then, and then, um, you know, every single event has an automatic. Because I think direct consumer would be really harder. There's a lot of right. players on direct consumer. Yeah, I think. Um, you know, one of the things that's important is to have some kind of freemium aspect to this because, you know, nobody wants to try the finished product on their wedding day, right? And they want to try it at a party yeah, right. or something like that. Um, I like going after weddings. Obviously, it's something where people are used to spending a lot of money. It gives you some pricing flexibility. Um, I, I just think part of this is just the, the, the really tough competition you guys are against. You know, whenever, I, at least I know on Android, whenever you, I take a picture, I can share it to like 30 different apps. Right. So, you know, sort of fighting for those you know, to be first on that list of places to share a picture is, yeah. is, is so that's tough. why we're that's why we're counting on the bride to say this is where you know I want the pictures here. Right. Um, yeah, I'm thinking beyond. We you know, in, in very other good uh, success when the bride emails right before. Sorry. <laughs> when the bride emails right before and like the day or two before the wedding and says everyone we're going to use this app, and then it's amazing the numbers that you see like you have like 20, 30, 40 percent of the wedding guests are using the app contributing to the gallery. Also on onboarding, so you know, if they have a, if they use it at their engagement party, so if you sort of organically grow the user base and the bride really is behind the app, if you have someone using it at, at the engagement party and then they share it on Facebook the next day and now you have five people and like very close friends, you know, and then they're like, well, what's this at? And then they see it on Facebook. And then by the time we're doing a wedding, October 1st, someone's having an Android themed wedding. So she's really like super almost, he gets scared sometimes, but she's almost too into it, but she wants Android this, Android that, and she's really pushing it. So by the time, you know, her wedding, everyone knows about it, you know, so she's been building up. Sorry. Okay. You could have finished the sentence, No, but I'm, I'm actually I'm going to move on because I want to make sure that we stay somewhat to the timer. Thank, thank you very much, Adam and Amir. Thank you. <laughs> Seth. I'm Seth Rabinowitz, the president of Lemon Mobile LLC, a startup here in New York. I want to talk about location-based marketing. It's a hot topic these days, uh, and with good reason, because if it's done right, can be very effective and, dare I say, even a little disruptive to the way that consumers and brands connect. Uh, that's the business we're in. I'm the president of the company, so if I do my job right over the next maybe five and a half minutes now, hopefully you'll agree that we're some of the people who are doing it right. So let's imagine a local business, and this hypothetical local business has what you might call some high-level problems. Millions of customers, but it knows very little about them. Packed store but every customer can barely sample the product. And when the customers are engaged, they're really engaged, but only one week a year. Well, it, actually, it's not a hypothetical. It pretty well describes the New York Marathon, Lemons, my company's first major client. Two and a half million spectators spread out over 26 miles in New York City one day a year. It's the biggest event of its kind in the world. 
So what we do is we sell a solution that enables the marathon to finally, at last, make relevant and personal connections with these customers, with these two and a half million people. And we do it based on each customer's exact physical location. Why location? Because we think of all the things you could know about somebody as a marketer. Remember the five W's, who, what, where, when, why. Where actually offers the most predictive power in terms of figuring out somebody's wants and needs at a specific moment in time. The problem with figuring out the where is that until now it's been pretty tough to do. There's a lot of friction from users and very little reliability for marketers. So the friction comes from the fact that each person has to remember or somehow be reminded to sort of self-disclose their location. Hey, I'm here. And the unreliability comes from the fact that self-announcement is full of errors because my definition of here is probably not the same as your definition of here, just to give one example. Plus, most brands lack the assets, the resources to really even do this. And then there's the age-old question for everything. Once you got the data, what do you do with it? Right? I mean, that's the biggest problem of all data. Well, we think we solved this problem. Uh, we focus on three very large global verticals, what we call travel and tourism, live events and gatherings, and then what we call buyer-seller matching. But because I only have six minutes, let's just stick to live events. And the problem in live events is the fact that the ticket buyer is frequently not the attendee. The ticket doesn't equal the turnstile. And most events are unticketed anyway. So yeah, it's true there's only one New York marathon, but there are countless other sports and entertainment events. And then there are parades, fireworks, street festivals, group public celebrations, and so on and so on. It's a massive potential marketplace. So our solution of how to address this problem is to build on probably the, one of the biggest constants of modern life, which is your mobile device, pulling mine out of my pocket, equals you. So if we can find your device, we can find you. And if we can do it repeatedly, then we can begin to understand your behaviors and start to build a relationship with you through direct communication, through rewards and recognition, through database analytics. So just a quick illustration to kind of show what this means. This is a visualization of location data generated by our system during my daily commute. All this data is generated passively by my BlackBerry. In less than an hour on Metro North. Anybody who rides the train knows that shape. Without me needing to do anything after I put the software on my device and opt in. So this is a big difference. You don't need to open an app each time. You don't need to do anything each time. It happens in the background. So imagine this data. I know it's small up here in this big room, but imagine at scale this kind of mobility data. So some of you are probably asking yourself now, well, hang on a second. Why would anybody want this on their phone? Uh, and so I should probably talk about our product strategy. So as I mentioned before, I need software on the device in order to do this, and I need an opt-in. But our strategy is not to try to persuade you to do that for me, for Lemon. It's a catchy name, I know, but it's not our strategy. We don't want you to download a Lemon app, and we don't want you to opt into a Lemon service. Our strategy is to provide white-label software to publishers of apps that already have that motivation for you, like the forthcoming Spectator app at the New York Marathon. So our product strategy is what we call the host app. We piggyback and embed within somebody else's app that already has that position in your mind. This is how we get to market. So a little bit about tech for this audience here. The strategy hinges really on easy integration with the host app. If we can't integrate and play nice with others, then we don't have a business. So to do that, we've assembled a blend of licensed technologies and own technologies that allow us to do this. Secondly, it's really important for us to be accurate. Uh, so with accuracy, we have used licensed technology to make sure that we stay current with the state of the art because things are evolving very quickly. Quickly on how we make money. The good news is we do make a little bit of money right now. Right now, it's software license fees and message delivery fees. In the future, it will be more and more data because as we build this database, the predictive value, the treasure trove, really gets to be very, very valuable. So we like data too. This is the obligatory sources and uses chart because we're here. We bootstrapped the company to date, but we are looking for money. We're looking for a million dollars. So if you're interested, let's talk. <laughs> Happy to do. And then lastly, the competitive landscape. This is a hot space. There's a lot of companies that say they offer location-based marketing. Most are like Foursquare, which many people here are probably familiar with. Check-in-based social networks. Newer entrants are in the daily deal side of things with like Groupon now. But what we do is a pure play direct marketing channel, pure and simple. So we compete with a handful of companies 
on quality and technology. That's it. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Finish right on time. All right. Who's going first? Go ahead. Sure. So I, I, I guess the one thing that maybe scares me a little bit is you know, privacy concerns, right? Yeah. If I install an, uh, an app from uh, the ING Marathon, you know, it's great that it's tracking the runners and whatever on that day, but then, you know, I find out a week later that, that I'm being tracked, I, you know, that, that's not gonna look good for ING or for you. So I wonder, you know, it, it is opt-in, but, but I wonder that this sort of, you, you know, I'm not gonna, this sort of latent property of the app just kind of ends up getting into, a, into trouble down the road. It's a great point. Absolutely agree. And it's a huge part of everything we do. So I would never uh, discount it or say that privacy doesn't matter. We have a couple of strategies to address it. The first is uh, it is opt-in and it's very, it's not opt-in paragraph 17 of 31 paragraphs in a, you know, legalese privacy statement. It's very straightforward on a splash page when you open the app to explain it. The second is, again, it's up to the property. And in the case of the marathon, they know they don't have 52 week a year kind of permission to speak with people. They, they would love to have it, but they know they don't have it. Maybe eventually they will. But so for them, the concept is around basically about an eight day window from T minus uh, a week to T plus one day from the Sunday before through what they call Marathon Monday. And that's it. And then the service goes away. They, they run out of content. They run out of things to say. So they're not going to abuse it. They've got a brand that they want to protect. They've got sponsors they want to protect. So that's how they address it in that case. And how are you guys dealing with uh, battery life issues? Yeah, another great question. Uh, a couple things. This is a big reason why we license the core location technology. This is evolving very quickly. Uh, anytime you hit the GPS on a device, it gobbles up a little bit of battery. So if you hit the GPS frequently, you gobble up a little bit of battery a lot of times. And over time, it does add up. And if you burn somebody's battery down, it doesn't matter how cool your app is, they're going to not like you. Uh, so we manage it with a set of server-side controls that can change what we call the location cadence, how frequently we ping the device. We can change that by rule, we can change that by time, we can also change it by behavior. So for example, at the marathon, if you were immediately on the race course, we might dial up the frequency so we had enhanced granularity. If you leave the race course, as you leave, our system triggers that departure and we dial down the cadence because you are no longer in the zone where granularity is going to be that relevant to you and we can ping on a less frequent basis. We've done lots of tests though and even at heavy, heavy ping rates, um, depending on what else you have open on your device, what else you're doing, we'll still get you home or time to call, you know, uh, your significant other or whatever the case. So it's an issue, a key issue, but we have a lot of strategies for it. And uh, going back to ease of use, so if someone downloads, has a, a marathon app already on their phone, mm -hmm. would they just get a email, you know, so would they just get a notice saying, hey, can we just track your location and it's very transparent or does someone have to then go down the Lemon Marathon app separately? No, excellent question. It's embedded. So it's a single download in the same way that like an internet browser has Flash. So you have Chrome or you have uh, Internet Explorer and it has some other third party software embedded. It's transparent, single process to the user. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in this case, there's just tabs at the bottom of the app for a variety of functions. One is called Games and Offers. Mm -hmm. And when you hit that one for the first time, a splash page will come up, which will explain to you the value proposition. You certify that you're over the age of 13 for uh, COPA compliance, mm -hmm. and then uh, there's also a big on-off switch at the top of that page, so that if you elect to temporarily disable the service, you know you can. It's, it it doesn't need to stay on permanently. You have user side controls as well. And are you compatible iPhone? You're compatible across smartphones. iPhone, Android, BlackBerry, Windows, to the extent it you know. Yeah. Uh, I think okay. going the event side is, is smart, just because there is, besides just the consumer daily deals or Foursquare, there is a fair amount of competition developing on the brand side. Um, for local marketing and so to go towards the event brands or something very specialized I think is a good way to enter the market and get away from the no noise a little bit. Yeah I mean if I hadn't uh, been so verbose I could have got to the final page which is a little bit of our history and you see the NFL logo up there mm -hmm. so uh, myself and one of my partners who's here uh, handsome gentleman in the back will wave his hand maybe Gord wave your hand well, They're all raising handsome, their hand. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so we come out of, we have a lot of background in this That's, business, and this was the genesis. For a lot, yeah. yeah, this was the genesis of the whole idea is that particular, there are, literally there are tens and tens of thousands of unticketed events in this country every year that attract significant audiences, significant sponsors, commercial interest. And they don't even have tickets. So forget about not even knowing who the ticket went to. They don't even have tickets to start with. People just turn up for the event. And so it's a real sweet spot for us, these unticketed, ungated events. And you know there are there are thousands of them here, and thousands and thousands more around the world. 
So I was going to suggest that I, I certainly like the marathon uh, use case. That's interesting and, uh, you know, fascinating, and I've known about it. <clears throat> but to get the investor's wallet out of the pocket, I feel like you need to spell out a big vision. So I feel like you're a great one-trick pony, and just to, you know, support you, I think you need to paint a bigger vision because the quadrant you showed, the magic quadrant, it's very crowded in each one of these other areas with lots of players, as you know. So where can you win big would be my first question. And second of all, tell me a story about now all the other big events, the uh, you know Tour de France, the other marathons, all the big stuff. Are you going after those and do you have a pipeline of, of those? You know tried to edit for the six minute uh, version mm -hmm. of this. If you gave me the six, uh, the, the 60 minute version, yeah. I mean, we do have a pipeline, it, it could always be fuller. Uh, we would love for it to be fuller, but we've identified within kind of that event space, again, we have a deep, deep network from uh, collectively between us 30 years of the National Football League uh, into all the major sports and entertainment properties in North America and uh, some in Europe as well. Um, so that's a big part of it. But I also, I don't want to lose sight, there are other verticals because we are at the same time talking to a large regional auto dealership that wants to use this exact same technology to optimize their service bay utilization. So they have 80 service bays. And they have a CRM system that knows how many of you need to get an oil change or come in for your end of lease inspection. And it's a lot of people. And you don't want to do it because it's a pain in the neck. They want you to do it because it's profitable and they you, know, they know you need it, eventually you'll do it. So it's two ships passing in the night. They've got a technician standing by while you're two miles away from the dealership needing an oil change and an end of lease inspection. So they want to use a same variant of this to send you a notification when you're two miles away that says, our guy's standing by, you'll be in and out in 15 minutes. And here's a free car wash if you do it now. And that is an entirely different vertical. It's got different kind of emotional connection points in terms of why somebody would want to do it and have the app. But it's also huge. If you think about the number of types of organizations that have that. We're doing another thing with golf courses. It's a very similar problem. Friday afternoon foursome. Three show up, one stuck on a conference call. Happens all the time. The three don't tell the course until five minutes before they tee off because I don't want to play with that guy sitting on the bench. Meanwhile, the course then is going to lose, you know, the revenue, one revenue unit. So there's a lot of people driving around with their golf clubs and choosing their trunk. Same concept there. Um, so it's... it's on, on that thought... I think we're going to go to the next. Perfect. <laughs> Thanks Thank so you. much, Seth. Thank Thanks. You. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Jonathan Yari. I'm the founder and CEO of Upsite, and um, we're actually fortunate enough to uh, to be involved in some very exciting uh, domain, which is motion control entertainment, and I'm here to tell you all about it. Um, I don't know how many of you know, but after selling, the, mm -hmm. after selling 10 million units in, in 10 weeks, uh, Kinect holds a Guinness World Record for uh, the fastest um, selling consumer electronic device. Uh, it's been crowned as such. And, and if, you see, if you look at it, um, you also see the Kinect, the new Kinect uh, title, um, um, Fruit Ninja, which was the first Kinect title which can be downloaded through the Xbox mm -hmm. uh, Live Arcade, which is the Xbox uh, App Store. It was released just a month ago, and uh, it ended up being one of the fastest selling um, XBLA um, titles. So it's very popular, and those are just two examples of uh, which actually demonstrate and improve end user demand uh, for motion control based user experience in games, uh, actually changing the way people interact with consumer electronic devices and, and uh, apps and, and games. Um, looking at this slide, you can see some, some of the relevant consumer electronics um, players in our domain. Most of them will be rolling out their motion control entertainment, uh, um, smart TVs, um, and set of boxes and media centers uh, throughout the next two to three quarters. And um, those consumer electronics players already understand that um, any innovative uh, user experience and some um, compelling motion control games and applications are really key success factors for users' adoption. Um, and as such, they need to complement their offering through some exciting uh, uh, games and applications and definitely build some uh, developer ecosystem which will keep on generating more and more apps and games. Um, this is where, where we actually come into effect um, and we are actually addressing those, uh, the needs of those uh, key players. Uh, we are offering uh, consumer electronic um, vendors motion control games and apps marketplace. 
um, turning those smart TVs, motion, uh, motion controlled set up boxes and so on into gaming devices. Um, our private label solution is actually is branded as the uh, consumer electronic mm -hmm. hardware vendor own store. So it's gonna be branded as LG uh, uh, own store or a Samsung own store. And it's gonna be pre-installed on the device, which is a prime location for any app store and obviously the default app store which users will use. Um, our offering is, uh, is actually SaaS based uh, and it's working across different motion control technology platforms and devices. Um, and we are actually um, offering, it's an end-to-end -end service. We're offering the platform, we're offering the content catalog, we're offering the developer community, which will keep on supporting this. And obviously the business operation and the, and the uh, store management of the app store. Um, as you can imagine, our market is pretty much fragmented um, on, on the, um, on the right end, uh, end side, you can see end users which are in need of inexpensive uh, games and apps which can be downloaded through um, App Store or through any other mechanism. On the, uh, on the right end, you can see actually developers who are actually looking for uh, a marketplace uh, or an outlet to sell and publish their uh, games and apps. And uh, as we discussed before, and the core technology providers and, and, the, com and the consumer electronics obviously are, are in need of, uh, I would say, um, add more value to their offerings, which is basically hardware and technology. This is, this is actually uh, where we come into effect and uh, we, we provide the missing link to enable this um, living room uh, or motion control living room revolution, uh, connecting the, the consumer electronic hardware manufacturers with the developers and with the end users. Um, our first customer you can see is Asus, uh, or uh, as they call themselves, Asus. Uh, this is how you can actually pronounce it in Taiwan. And we are actually launching next month uh, with them. Um, this will be the first launch after the last year Kinect launch, uh, which, uh, which was very successful. And we are very happy uh, to be part of this launch. Uh, on the right side, uh, you can see some of our partners. Uh, we're working with PrimeSense, which is the company behind the Kinect. Um, and with, with whom, actually with PrimeSense, we are jointly marketing our app store, our marketplace to their existing customers. We are also working with the smaller ones, uh, the smaller core technology providers, Point Grab, Eyesight, XDR. And equally important, uh, at the bottom of the slide, you see OpenNI. OpenNI is, an, is a developer community. Uh, they have like 4,000 developers developing motion control application and games. And uh, with us, any developer can actually publish its own apps and games uh, through a single click. And we are very excited to partner with them. Um, and this would prove us more and more value. Our, our October launch, um, this would be our October launch. Uh, we are going to feature uh, some 30 games and apps. And uh, given that I don't have uh, much of time, I would just say projected revenues for us would be $2 million for the next two years. Um, this is our market potential. Um, it's big. It's one of, I'm a surfer, and uh, I've seen waves around. And this is one of the biggest waves uh, I've seen uh, so far, uh, both on the gaming side and on the smart TV side. Uh, this is how we actually target our customers. Uh, it's, a, it's a small market and uh, everybody actually discusses uh, and, and speaks with everybody. And we're approaching uh, the consumer electronics both directly and through our uh, core technology providers. Our business model, this is actually one of the simplest slides here. Um, it's the regular 30-30 business model uh, where we actually have 30% uh, and uh, according to our initial calculations, our users are going to spend uh, $40 per year. Okay, um, just, uh, just to complete it, uh, funding to date, we've uh, actually um, raised uh, $0.8 million from angels and some uh, uh, well-known European seed uh, fund investing in, in seed uh, companies. And we're actually seeking, uh, um, we will start uh, soon uh, to, uh, to seek uh, some 3 to $5 million with those objectives to expand our distribution network, to extend our account catalog, uh, build our consumer brand, and basically building, our, building a sustainable competitive advantage which will serve us as we go forward. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Who wants to go first? Who wants to go first? So, yeah, I've done, I've done some investing around this area. I guess the one clarification I'd like to get from you is, initially when I was hearing this, I was thinking, oh, he's gonna you know, work with the publishing community and, you know, make sure they build, you know, thinking through this motion control and then you're going to get paid by the device manual. You know, the, the CE guys are going to be your customers. So I'm just trying to understand better 
who you really see now that first two million is that from the end user downloading mm -hmm. you um, or is that really a CE device? You no, know, the it, Microsoft's paying you. The CE devices are just paying us some setup fees and NREs. Uh, this right. is not the two millions are actually from uh, from revenues generated through um, direct sales to consumers, whether it's per download, per subscription, and so on. And how closely do you have to tie it within the publishing community um, to obviously make the? It's you know it's 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 close. Um, we are actually engaged with uh, quite a few already mm -hmm. uh, through. Uh, the, the, the launch catalog of, of ASUS is all already demonstrating that and we're working with mobile publishers and casual publishers and, and, and so on. And obviously there are the, uh, the, the list of companies who are already developing games specifically for this market, whether mm -hmm. it's for Kinect or any other platform. Yeah. So we need to work with them. It's, a, it's actually a triangle of us connecting the developers yeah. and, uh, and uh, consumer electronics vendors. Because it seems you, know, you need to be known for like, you know, Connect was because it had some great programming behind it, made sure. it fun for people to sure. use it. Sure. Uh, and so it seems like if you had that mm -hmm. one or two key partners that could let people say, wow, you got to tell this because the, the game's 18 times, like so much more exciting All if right. you have this, um, is a go to wit market launch versus, versus just direct consumer. So that was sure. Right. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's definitely dependent upon obviously uh, the uh, popularity of the games, mm -hmm. and uh, we see we actually targeting we actually building a catalog and programming, if you will, both top down, really picking the, the, the nice games that we believe can actually be ported to motion control and can mm -hmm. really are popular enough, such as for example, uh, Tiny Beefs. Uh, if anybody is familiar mm -hmm. with. This is our, actually, you know, the, uh, the variants <laughs> of the Fruit Ninja, which is available on Kinect on one hand. On the other hand, those are, there, are, there are the really um, exciting action-based full-body games that you play, um, mm -hmm. you know, some um, skydiving and, yeah. and, and, and so on. And this is actually one, one of the uh, biggest parts in, in the catalog. And on the other hand, we, this is the top-down, the, mm -hmm. the bottom-up <coughs> is actually partnering with the, uh, with the developer community. Sure. which will keep on developing uh, uh, um, applications mm -hmm. and then you know consumer will choose whether those are <coughs> successful successful or or anything like this mm -hmm. that's where i was going also peg so one thing i love to share with ceos is look if you're talking to an institution we have to get other people's wallets out of their pocket our partners we have to get them excited sure. and one thing you could that would really help your uh, your pitch would sure. be you know, what is your true differentiated competitive advantage? Mm -hmm. You haven't really shared that in okay. this. You could build that in sure. where Peg was going. Sure, sure. And, uh, and is there any IP around this that makes you special, different, better? Why would I want to take my wallet out and help you okay. scale? So either sure. share that or build that in. Sure. To, uh, I mean, uh, currently, we mainly compete with the internal solutions of those consumer electronic um, mm -hmm. vendors they built some app stores for mobile and, and their tablet offerings uh, they weren't successful from the beginning uh, and they were and they are not used today so why they would be successful on the, suddenly on, on a brand new user experience and so on um, um, and this is on one hand on the other hand it takes much more than just uh, an app store platform to, to build an ecosystem of developers uh, this is why and you know their DNA is really they're focused on the hardware side mm -hmm. and, and, and on you know distribution uh, this is why they see the value of joining forces with us because we provide them with, uh, with you know, developer community, the app store, the, the user experience because we believe that we can actually build a better user experience than, than what they are actually bringing them to the table. Uh, and, and they provide, and this is what we actually provide them. And so competition wise today, I would say uh, it's, uh, they are the main competition, at least mind share wise. Uh, but you know, further down the road, probably when this market starts to grow, um, uh, there will be others that will uh, enter this market, probably the mobile app stores as well. Um, but at that point of time, we'll have uh, many more assets. We'll, you know, we'll really know what what users are actually looking for in terms of games. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll have the analytics. We'll have the developers, and we'll be we'll continue if we actually continue in generating revenues for all the stakeholders. I guess uh, uh, we'll be in a good position to ride this wave. So I love the tailwinds. I think the technology is really fun. I think one of the challenges, as you're saying, is these guys are bad at UI. They're mm -hmm. bad at software. <laughs> you know, I have a TV with I don't know how many different apps on it, and I've <laughs> used zero. Um, sure. So I think you know, having right. this app store and having a revenue tied to users getting excited about yeah. getting excited about it, you have to make sure that <laughs> this is front and center. You know, you probably have to work with whoever's building the UI for the device that you're, you know, 
place prominently, and then make sure that you have a catalog that's compelling. You know, get sure. whatever is hot on the connect and put it there front and center. You know, don't even maybe not even have an app store. Just have these things sort of promoted so people are sure. pulled into your ecosystem from the beginning. Sure, that, that, that's a great point. Actually, we we actually designed the. Uh, the ASUS, uh, the ASUS device uh, um, together with them. So we make sure that it's going to be simple. To the registration would be simpler uh, and the whole uh, experience would be as engaging as possible. And as far as the catalog, you are perfectly right. I mean, that we need to bring more and more compelling AAA uh, titles. Thank you. That was Thank you very much. Right thanks. Thanks, Jonathan. Hi everyone, my name is Jason Sosa. I'm the CEO of Immersive Labs. We are Techstars New York company, and we use uh, facial recognition and intelligence software for digital science. Almost 10 years ago, the film Minority Report gave us a vision of the future, excuse me, with intelligent ads that could change dynamically uh, for target audiences. And we are making this vision a reality using today's technology. And we're all familiar with digital science, and you see them in malls, in shopping centers, and airports. And there's no reason why these existing digital signs couldn't fulfill their promise. Even though 70% of these signs are connected to the internet and have computers, there's still a major problem. Digital signs are stupid. This guy doesn't want to look at this ad, and this doesn't help the advertiser at all. And they really have two options. They can either randomly rotate ads, or they can manually schedule a playlist. Not very effective, uh, considering that 80% of their costs are operational, not in hardware or software. So immersive is software that works with existing digital signs. Our software can determine age, gender, attention time, and even works with large crowds. And by calculating the probability of success for each ad in the inventory, we were able to help ad networks and retail stores optimize digital signage content for digital signs. This allows the best ads to be displayed for each impression opportunity. <laughs> So signs are stupid, but we can make them smart. We can turn this Tampax ad into a Bud Light ad in real time. And what's more, we can tell advertisers, we can tell advertisers who has looked and for how long. So now there's no more wasted ad impressions. Let me give you some more examples of how we make digital signs smarter. So our sign can recognize if someone standing in front of a sign is male or female, young or old, and can deliver content that gets them to engage. This can be through a gestural, uh, gestural interface, like we saw earlier, or even a touch screen, or even your mobile device. And we've already tested this in the real world. We completed pilot tests at the Sony Style Store here in New York City, among other major retailers. And the results show a 60% increase in the attention time of consumers when using our optimization technology over the standard rotation techniques that are used today. And since graduating Techstars uh, this last April, we've had a huge amount of press coverage, uh, even today with ABC News and a few others. So there's, this, to this uh, press coverage has given us a huge opportunity to reach out to a whole bunch of different customers. Here are just some of the 40 plus companies that have expressed interest in our technology. We have multiple letters of intent and several planned deployments throughout the remainder of this year, uh, inc including starting out this fall. The digital signage market is one of the fastest growing ad segments. It's second only to the internet. It's a $3.5 billion industry. And over the next five years, it's projected to grow to nearly $6 billion, representing nearly half of all the out-of-home ad spend. In the US today, there are 3 million digital signs. But the problem is that they're fragmented across more than 400 different ad networks. This makes it a pain for media buyers to plan, buy, and distribute their advertising. They have to contact each, each uh, venue individually. So Immersive Lab solves this problem. By having our software on these different ad networks, we were able to uh, aggregate all this content together and distribute these ads. So we, we solve the problem of fragmented distribution, and we charge a percentage fee for the delivery mechanism for those ads. Plus, we provide analytics back to the advertiser. Uh, the main value we get for the ad networks is that they get the ability to know who looked, how long, and uh, we optimize and automatically schedule those ad, um, ad serving. Uh, and then for the media buyers, of course, they get the optimization and the uh, optimized ad spend. And as we expand our reach, advertisers can upload their content, they can set their budgets, and they can set their target markets for where they want to deliver those ads. And of course, we provide real world analytics, the same way they get on the web, but now for the real world. And I want to stress that we've built our technology to work with the, today's existing infrastructure. So all the signs 
and players that are out there in the field today, by adding a simple low-cost sensor, it'll uh, be able to make, enable these signs to be smarter digital signs. We recently, uh, during, actually during Techstars, we had the opportunity to present to the Media Kitchen. It's a $550 million planning and buying agency here in New York City. And the president of the firm called our technology game-changing for the ad industry. Here's our team. Uh, my name is Jason Sosa. I'm the CEO. Uh, I, my previous startup, Mindspring Research, was acquired by Troy Research. Uh, I've been in media research and uh, technology for uh, over the last 10 years. Previously conducted studies with Clear Channel, McVeigh New Media. Justin Holmes is a startup vet with IPix, founded a $1.2 billion IPO company with 300 employees. Previously founded IGA. And Jill Miller is the previous uh, president of the Digital Signage Group. Digital signage is one of the fastest growing ad segments. We are able to deliver the right message to the right person at the right time, the same way Google does online, but now for the real world. Thank you. All right, so there are 3 million, 3 million signs out there, 400 ad networks. How far have you guys gotten in terms of? <laughs> well, we're rolling out to over, uh, uh, over 20 locations just in the next couple months. So we're rolling out one of the largest digital out of home networks in combination with one of the largest uh, digital out of home ad agencies. And, and how much is your sensor cost? Um, right now, it's, it's basically the cost of a webcam. So if you think about your Android phone or your iPhone, it's a very low cost sensor, something in the 2 to $5 range. Uh, right now, we're the, co the customers are covering the cost of those sensors. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we, you know, we looking at, uh, as we look at funding, planning to subsidize the cost of those. Great. Great. Yeah, I, you know, I've, I was on a board called PRN that did a lot of um, at-home retail promotion. And uh, the hard part is your customer base exception of Clear Channel, I guess it's one of the big gorillas, are not the most tech savvy type of, uh, you know, it took us a while to get digital signs <laughs> and taxi cabs. So um, I think, you know, having large partnerships, which sounds like you've made some headway, is absolutely critical. If you have to go to the mom and pop groups, um, it's, a, it's a long, long haul. Uh, and yeah, I think, you know, it, it really, it'll depend on the lift you can get for them in terms of their, can you deliver, is this enough to have them to be able to charge extra for the advertising in a meaningful way that the advertiser understands? Um, these guys just don't want to add, you know, more targeting behavioral unless they're getting the lift. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, tracking in the early days of your launch, the analytics around that is going to be critical for you to be able to continue the, the rollout. Absolutely. Yeah, and to, to answer your, your, your statement on that, uh, so 10 companies represent nearly 70% of the revenues. Yep. So Clear Channel is actually more concentrated on, on traditional out of home. So there's a bit of a difference between traditional print out of home and digital out of home. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's just something that uh, you yeah. know, it's being more aware of. So let me suggest this as a way of supporting you and uh, uh, you know, suggesting this to the rest of the, not only the CEOs tonight, but those of you who are building companies. We use a one-liner at Starvest that I really love, which is the right CEO knows what to do and how to do it. And I praise you, Jason, for laying that out. Like, you build confidence in us as an investor that you do know what to do and how to do it. Your uh, clear strategy around going to market, the traction you're getting, you know, uh, a pedigreed team, and what you're doing in a very... Uh, uh, before uh, this, uh, you know, uh, whole uh, discussion, a very complex, crowded, and very low-tech marketplace that most of us haven't really enjoyed. But you've made it seductive, interesting, and compelling, and that's exciting. So, uh, you know, I, I praise you for that because I, I think that's what, you know, gets, uh, again, uh, our wallets out. Uh, so that that's pretty cool. And... Uh, and I just suggest, you know, that uh, one-liner to those of you who are trying to build, that just trying to show us that you know how to make it happen and scale a business. That, that's what the uh, real hallmarks are of success, I feel, in an, in an entrepreneur. So, hey, continue best and, and go for it. Thank Exciting. You. Thank you very much. Congrats on the fundraise. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. That was great, Jason. Thanks. So we've been so good about sticking to the time that uh, I just want to open the floor up to the audience for a few minutes. If you have any questions in the audience for our panelists or for the entrepreneurs that presented. And by the way, entrepreneurs, you were amazing. Thank you yeah. Yeah. very much for yeah. presenting. Um, I saw a hand in the back. 
for the last presenter, I mean, I know you're, you're building on existing technologies, but there are technologies. Google just announced what Google Wallet would be embedded. Um, uh, I guess it's uh, technology to, to be able to like pay pay for things. So near field technologies. And once that's once that's there, I mean, what would be the, the reason to have these low cost cameras and signs? I would, you know, I could have recognized from your phone. And, so I, I and just want to re repeat the question. Market. Yeah, I, I just want to repeat the question so everybody can hear it. I, I think you're, you're, you're wondering whether Google Wallet presents a... Or just near field technologies would right. easily serve what you're already putting out there in the market with low cost cameras. So a competitive landscape. Issue. You asked about the integration with all these other devices. So uh, yeah, uh, near field communications can be a big part of it, but it's more of a, a piece of it. So with, with near field, you can have an opt-in system. So when you go into a Gap store, they can say, I like these shirts. People who like these shirts also like these other items. You can have recommendation experiences. Um, but it doesn't, it's going to be difficult um, unless the sign actually knows that somebody's there. I think it's a public interface is what a digital sign is, where a cell phone is more of a private interface where you're entering personal credit card information. You wouldn't do that on a giant touch screen. So I think there's some uh, definite use cases for uh, near field communication, but it's more as a, uh, an identification tool for, to identify someone as they go into a store for a loyalty program. But it's part of an offline online integration that's happening right now. Part of that's gesture, touch, mobile, but it's also intelligence within the store. So that's just one component of it. Jason, while you're up, you know, when there's a crowd or even like three or four people, how does the, uh, the can distinguish you know, three or four people and decide what to show? So it actually isn't doing um, just gender specific ads. It's not male ads for men or female ads for women. It's uh, more sophisticated than that. It takes into account weather, the time of day, the day of the week but all the ads that are based in the inventory. So if there's a Starbucks ad in the inventory, it actually may make the decision that it's morning and it's more relevant to show that ad than it would be to show something else. Or if people are tweeting about dog walking and there's a, a Petco ad in the inventory, it's way more reasonable to show Petco. So it, we're taking into account geolocation information, um, a lot of other things that are being done online, we're taking that methodology and bringing it to the offline world. And the advertisers get uh, charged according to how long the ad is up for it's, it's not quite a pay-per-look thing yet. I mean, it took time for the web to kind of adopt a performance-based uh, model. So we're, we're, we're sticking with a CPM-based model, but we're taking a percentage of that, of that CPM. Okay, go ahead. go ahead. Yeah, I'd just like to know if you're planning to build a database with the data or whether it's just <laughs> used at the moment. Um, no, it, it's, uh, it's all anonymous information. So it's not even really a camera. Well, we call it a sensor because it's not recording or, or videotaping anyone. It's all anonymous information. It looks at a face and puts a numerical value on that face and says this is either male or female. It doesn't actually re remember a person from screen to screen. If you come back, you're a totally different person. So there's nothing that's uh, identifying uh, you individually. Well, still, it could have value as, as in, at this location, we always find people are interested in this. And that's where near field would come into play. So if right. you wanted to opt into that system in a, in a, re in a location, that'd be a possibility. <coughs> Okay, uh, go ahead, some questions? I have a question for the judges. Um, when you look at different deals, how seriously do you look at their future projections? I mean, I've done lots of deals. It looks like they're going to Disney. Right? So the question is, how seriously do the panelists take future projections? It's correct. We really scrub the numbers. We take business models, do sensitivity analysis, figure out how real or imaginary they are, build our own models around it. It's really critical for both valuation and scale. We don't want to have a midget at the end of five years. <laughs> yeah, and I was, it's obviously stage-oriented, too. At, the, at this stage, um, you look really hard at the management team. Do they understand their market? Um, and you know, I think you know, the key part is talking to key customers about the scalability of something like this, so it's maybe less exact, you know, you're not looking at three or four years maybe for a seed deal, you might be looking more at this, this is the 12, you know, the year or two outlook, you know, achievable. Um, but certainly, you know, some of the stages you're at too, where they've already been launched, um, you want to make sure the management team knows how to forecast and then control their expenses accordingly because there's a lot of companies that have obviously gotten in trouble about spending way ahead of their revenues. Right. So. And uh, in addition to that, do they understand how much capital is required to get it to a certain scale? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with all that, and, but uh, certainly at the early stage, we look <coughs> a lot closer at the entrepreneur than we do at, at projections because yeah. things always change. Yep, good. All right. 
That's it. So thank you so much. Uh, thanks to the judges. Thanks to the presenters. And uh, enjoy the next.